This is Jeff Weiss with HRT 211, Unit 6, and the topics this week are seed selection, production, and handling. So for this week, uh, we will be um, referring to material that's in uh, Hartman's chapters 5 and 6. You'll have the lecture material, and there's a number of videos posted in Enter for you to look at. Um, our discussion question will, about, will be about seed testing. Uh, this week uh, you'll have an opportunity to take home exam number one. And because of that, uh, we'll take assignment six and do it in our lab. And then um, in our lab, we will um, make um, not cuttings, but grafts from practice wood. Uh, we're going to dissect flowers, fruit, and seeds and draw them. And we'll get into uh, a little bit of producing offsets from uh, bulbs and perhaps some uh, tubers or corms if I can get a hold of them by that, by, uh, that evening. Uh, there's a wide variety of terms and concepts associated with these topics and we'll get into them in some uh, detail, uh, but I urge you to dig deeper and to uh, spend some time um, with the text and with your own uh, uh, investigations into these issues and these ideas. And the learning objectives will be to begin to understand and um, describe breeding systems, um, methods of controlling uh, genetic variability, uh, seed selection and production, a uh, little bit on seed sources, seed tests. Uh, we'll get into germination more in uh, the next unit and uh, uh, a little bit on storage. So some of the major um, breeding systems that are in use uh, involve uh, pollination. The issue of pollination, uh, if you recall from our prior lesson, is the uh, mixing and recombination of uh, uh, genes and genetic information uh, in the process of um, going from a, a, a flower to a seed. And uh, there are both uh, species and plants and situations in which uh, cross-pollination is desired and there are uh, situations in which uh, uh, we want to maintain uh, the characteristics, the exact characteristics of the parent plant so uh, uh, self-pollination uh, is important and, and uh, enforced in those situations. And then there's some situations where um, the characteristics of a group of uh, parent plants, uh, especially these heirloom varieties where that is to be maintained, and in those cases uh, uh, pollination is encouraged between plants, uh, but those plants of the same variety are isolated from each other in order to maintain um, a characteristic called trueness of type. And we're going to talk about um, these trueness criteria in breeding systems and seed selection um, a little bit further as we go. But going back up to cross-pollination, um, in, in these cases uh, the offspring are heterogeneous, heterogeneous and heterozygous. And uh, in, unless the uh, breeding is carefully controlled um, the um, crossing of hybrid plants will produce uh, offspring that do not conform to the standards uh, for that plant. On the other hand, uh, cross-pollinated plants uh, are likely to show hybrid vigor uh, where the size exceeds the, the size of the offspring exceeds the size and the vitality of both parent plants. So cross-pollination has uh, both benefits and limitations in a, a, a for, for a breeding system. On the other hand, uh, self-pollination uh, for homozygous plants is natural in, in the case of 
Uh, some plants that we'll talk about, especially things such as grains and uh, tomatoes, uh, there's a high degree of self-pollination. In other plants though, this in order to uh, maintain um, uh, consistency and the qualities that we're looking for, um, self-pollination needs to be enforced. However, over the long term, uh, uh, self-pollination can lead to inbreeding and uh, loss of size or vigor, and this is called inbreeding depression. So finding the right balance and the uh, best approach for each individual crop, plant, or situation uh, requires uh, considerable expertise and um, knowledge on the part of the plant propagator. And going back now to the uh, flower types, um, uh, species have a number of different uh, strategies built into them for either um, uh, maintaining self-pollination or trying to enforce uh, cross-pollination. And I, I just want to recap quickly for you what some of those uh, strategies are. Uh, the first case is one of a perfect flower and we're going to be dissecting a perfect flower and that and that's one that has both um, male and female parts, uh, uh, stamens and, uh, and sepals uh, I'm sorry, uh, petals and sepals uh, all on the same flower. In other words, um, all of the flower parts are located on each flower. And that's kind of the classic case of the lily pictured in this example, uh, but many uh, species do not conform with that, uh, with that model. In fact, uh, there's um, uh, cases uh, where plants are monoecious, monoecious and uh, there are um, plants where uh, uh, male and female flowers are different uh, but they're located on the same plant and then there's dioecious uh, plants where uh, male and female uh, plants have uh, uh, flowers located on different plants. And then in addition to um, that criteria, um, certain plants have other strategies for self-pollinating or cross-pollinating. Uh, cere some cereal grains may be 95% self-pollinating. Uh, there's a situation mentioned in a prior lesson where aptomictic seeds are produced, um, and those are asexual seeds um, with no cross-pollination. Um, and they're important in the um, citrus and in the production of citric and mango fruit, uh, the use of apometic seeds. And then there's a number of other uh, strategies, including dichogamy, uh, where the um, uh, male uh, parts, the uh, the uh, pollinating parts of the plants uh, shed pollens uh, at a different time from when the uh, staminate flowers, the female flowers, are receptive to pollen. So that the same um, flowers on the same plant are uh, uh, available for um, pollination at different times. And this enforces um, cross-pollination and uh, uh, some plants, uh, as a result of this uh, dichogamy strategy, uh, assure that 95% of their flowers are cross-pollinated. So um, horticulturalists need to understand and employ strategies that uh, will um, uh, result in the production of uh, seeds to um, meet their breeding requirements, their uh, consistency and selection requirements, uh, but at the same time working within the uh, uh, genetic requirements and strategies of these various plants. So changing gears now, um, some of the goals of uh, seed selection and production that we're going to talk about have to do with um, several criteria. And these goals or criteria are trueness to name, and we're going to show examples of, pl of seed uh, labels. But it's critical that seeds, since they're stored sometimes uh, 
in, in many batches over a period of time that they're uh, labeled uh, completely and accurately for the uh, needs of the seed producer as well as the uh, uh, the grower. Um, the second uh, criterion is trueness to type and that is the important criteria that the seeds um, the plants that will come out of those seeds will conform to the uh, standards um, required for that plant. Uh, third goal of seed uh, production is that the seeds are free con from contaminants, uh, weeds, disease, pathogens, and uh, uh, other crops. And finally, and we did some work on this uh, topic, uh, in our last lab that the seeds are going to be viable and will produce uh, healthy seedlings and plants uh, when they're sowed in the uh, in the greenhouse or in the field. So a little bit about plant labeling and this is just an example of um, uh, a label for a uh, hybrid corn for a batch of hybrid corn seed and uh, you can see the uh, very detailed information uh, and the uh, uh, certification uh, that this uh, that these seeds are um, true to type correctly labeled and the uh, results of the uh, germination tests uh, are um, published on the seed label Now, as um, seeds, especially hybrid seeds, are produced, um, there is a sequence of um, events that occur from um, the production of a small amount of seed that come out of a breeding program. And um, before that seed is ready to be released uh, across the country or across the world uh, to growers, uh, that seed needs to be increased in defined steps and so uh, the uh, seed that comes out of a, out of a breeding program uh, a new hybrid seed is first called breeders seed um, it's uh, distributed to uh, researchers um, frequently in academic institutions for um, increase under uh, close supervision and that is called foundation seed and then that seed in turn is released to uh, registered growers for further increase and finally uh, is uh, available as certified seed uh, expect, inspected and approved by a certifying agency and uh, there are many uh, public and private organizations involved in uh, testing and certifying seed um, that is then uh, used to produce the seed that's uh, grown by uh, farmers. Now throughout this process um, uh, the genetic variability of seeds is um, uh, there are some controls on the genetic variability of the seeds and they are selected for trueness to type. Uh, but there's a variety of principles involved here depending on what kind of uh, seed and what the purpose of the seed is and, I, and this is a little bit of a complex slide but I'm going to try to get through some of those principles and, and hopefully make it clear uh, a, a little bit about where those uh, uh, principles apply. Uh, so the first case uh, is uh, the case of uh, wildflower seed and, and this is uh, what I'm involved in for um, producing seeds to plant in ecological restoration projects. Um, so in order to um, um, vegetate sites that are being uh, restored, um, the uh, idea of provenance comes into play. So uh, uh, seeds in our, and, and plants in our forest preserves and high quality natural areas are uh, adapted to the local conditions there. and um, we want to uh, only put in seeds that are going to be uh, adapted and uh, be local ecotypes that are 
uh, adapted and, and not bring in seeds from faraway locations that are going to change the, um, the, the, the genetics, the appearance, and the um, um, behavior of the uh, local plants. So the idea is to bring in um, uh, seeds from um, uh, populations that are located within a certain defined radius of the, uh, of the site where we're uh, planting them. And in the case of the Nature Center where I work, we have a limit of 25 miles uh, provenance where we'll bring in prairie plants uh, and a little larger radius because uh, woodland uh, seeds are harder to come by of 50 miles. And uh, within that radius, we want to encourage um, uh, genetic variability. Uh, but we do not want to bring in uh, seeds or plants from outside of that radius. Uh, now that is in stark contrast to the um, situation with um, uh, uh, most uh, seeds produced for um, um, crop plants and uh, seeds are produced in um, locations uh, for that variety and they are going to be subject to um, a rigorous uh, selection. So the, one of the uh, main techniques in selecting um, conforming plants are to remove um, all varieties that, that do not conform. So in the case of these uh, zucchinis you can see how consistent they are in um, size and shape and quality and um, through a, um, a, a selection process, any plants that did not produce uh, conforming zucchinis would be removed and the seeds from those plants would not be used. And over time, that's how um, selection occurs for um, crop plants, is by only selecting the seeds uh, of the best of the best and the most consistent and, and uh, uh, top performing varieties and using those uh, seeds to um, produce more or even improved strains of seeds over time. Now in the case of um, plants like squash um, and zucchinis, uh, those uh, plants readily interbreed with other uh, related plants, cucumbers, uh, squashes, and so those uh, plants are um, raised in isolation and so um, uh, they are screened so that uh, pollinators uh, such as bees and other uh, pollinators cannot get at and uh, um, pollinate those um, those varieties instead they're um, only crossed with other uh, conforming uh, plants so the idea of isolation and roguing are um, uh, uh, some of the methods in which uh, the uh, hybrid, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, seed um, production process is uh, continued over time and frequently uh, checked out by conducting prog progeny tests in the field. So. Um, the only way to see uh, for sure how your seeds uh, are going to produ uh, develop and um, uh, produce crops is to grow them out in the field and test them. And uh, we're going to get into this uh, in, in more detail uh, when we talk about uh, open pollinated uh, plants uh, at the Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa. Uh, but I wanted to uh, introduce these techniques and the importance of uh, seed selection in maintaining quality and consistency uh, in our um, in our breeding programs. Another way in which this uh, genetic variability is controlled and the um, maintaining uh, trueness of type is by hand pollination. So in the case of uh, this uh, fellow standing on a ladder. He's actually pollinating uh, apple trees by hand and trying to maintain the, uh, uh, the trueness of the apples to the uh, um, 
variety that that he's trying to grow. Um, in most cases, however, and and we're going to try to get into this in our lab. In in most cases, this is a lot more easily done uh, in dwarf varieties uh, where these uh, uh, trees are uh, and the flowers are much more accessible. Um, hand pollination is also done uh, uh, in the case of hybrid corn breeding programs, and so this is an important uh, technique in order to um, uh, control the genetic variability of um, hybrid plants. Now in order to um, reduce the um, genetic variability, uh, as I mentioned before, certain uh, crops are grown in these isolation chambers and these are designed uh, to um, limit and reduce the amount of uh, pollination done by insects and in order to reduce the amount of uh, genetic variability between plants. So um, we'll be talking about uh, uh, seed sources, um, but uh, again, I want to uh, set up a little bit of a comparison between um, um, seeds grown in the field uh, as crop plants and seeds uh, used in the wild for um, uh, ecological restoration and uh, site maintenance of uh, natural areas. And so uh, seed uh, sources include uh, last year's uh, uh, seed production, wild seed collecting, um, seed exchanges, and uh, again uh, Seed Savers Exchange will be covered in a future unit. Uh, in forestry, uh, elite trees and stock trees are maintained which are uh, uh, single sources of, uh, of propagules with su superior qualities. And in orchards, uh, um, Seed orchards uh, can be uh, used to produce uh, seeds. However, as we'll see in our grafting um, um, lab in a couple weeks' time, um, most uh, fruit trees come from um, grafting operations rather than production of seeds. In other words, they're produced through asexual rather than um, sexual propagation techniques. So seed harvesting, um, again the uh, techniques and approaches vary widely depending on whether we're talking about widely used uh, um, uh, fruit and vegetable production techniques or um, harvest of wild seed. Um, but they depend on the type of fruit or the type of seed that's uh, involved. Um, the time when that seed becomes ripe and undergoes the process of maturation drying uh, and the time and method of planting that's going to be employed. And again, we'll get into more of these topics in Unit 14 and 15 when we're talking about seed saving and um, storing uh, and, and protecting the uh, genetic heritage of, um, of, of our plants. So seeds are processed, again, through a variety of techniques. Uh, threshing of grain seeds uh, involves going out with a, um, a reaper and uh, uh, some of these machines are um, can be up to a million dollars per machine where they go out into fields of, of um, corn and soybeans and harvest uh, uh, grain for um, commodity but also can be used for um, collecting uh, uh, seed for uh, production purposes. Uh, but for the most part uh, the seeds are uh, produced uh, on a much uh, smaller basis and here's some examples of technologies that are used in uh, cleaning seeds and in uh, uh, drying them uh, in this case, uh, 
uh, a a clothes dryer is used for tumbling batches of seeds in order to try to get them down to the desired moisture level. Um, stratification uh, and um, scarification of seeds were something that were um, uh, demonstrated in a earlier uh, lab. Uh, macerating seeds, uh, you can see what um, one uh, person does in preparing uh, tomato seeds by mashing them and uh, uh, filtering the, uh, uh, the the pulp skins and impurities out of the out of the seeds, and in some cases, chemical treatment with uh, uh, sulfuric acid uh, is uh, required in order to uh, uh, prepare the seeds for uh, eventual uh, uh, germination and production. So seed testing uh, in various stages of production is conducted by uh, governmental, university, and private organizations. And the important seed tests are for uh, viability, purity, vigor, health, contamination, contamination, and moisture content. Germination tests are usually conducted under moist, warm conditions. Um, and the uh, relative number of germinated and ungerminated seeds are counted in order to term determine the um, uh, viability or the uh, ratio of uh, germination. In cold tests, uh, seeds are exposed to cold temp temperature uh, to assess their response to adverse conditions. Uh, the tetrazoleum or TZ test we conducted in our last lab is a chemical test uh, where uh, uh, live seeds are detected by uh, uh, counting the proportion of uh, potentially live seeds in a batch. And the purity test is one that uh, uh, gives information about the physical condition of seed and the presence of other unwanted materials in a batch of seeds. Once the seeds are cleaned and processed, um, they can also be treated in a variety of ways. Uh, the um, coating of seeds has become a big business, and uh, seeds are um, uh, can be um, coated and processed with uh, materials to protect them from damage and to extend their um, their uh, period of viability. Uh, they can be um, uh, given treatments to uh, increase their uh, germination or to maintain their uh, uh, their ability to uh, germinate under the conditions in which they'll be sown. Uh, they can be inoculated. In particular, inoculants with um, uh, rhizobium for um, nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria and uh, inoculation with um, uh, beneficial mycorrhizae are two of the techniques that are uh, frequently used to treat seeds. And they can, and especially high value seeds, can be coated uh, in order to make increase the size and make it easier and uh, uh, more accurate uh, to sow them in the field. So in other words, uh, for tiny seeds, increasing their size uh, makes it easier for them to be sown at the desired um, uh, density uh, in the, out in the uh, location where they will be uh, they'll be uh, planted. Then it's frequently necessary to store seeds uh, for a period of time uh, uh, after they're processed and before they're planted. And for most plants, um, the colder the better. Um, the, the conditions in which uh, seeds maintain their viability are um, most determined by the temperature and the moisture content of the place in which they're stored. In the um, perfect conditions, uh, seeds can remain viable for hundreds of years. And this uh, lower picture is the, uh, a location on an offshore island uh, north of Norway 
that is a seed vault, uh, sometimes called the doomsday vault, that we're going to be talking about in a future lesson, uh, where um, crop seeds are uh, being stored um, and are expected to be maintained uh, for hundreds of years because of the conditions in which they're being kept. So the um, criteria here is longevity. Uh, how long seeds will um, uh, remain viable and able to germinate once they're planted uh, depends on whether they're recalcitrant or orthodox seeds. If you recall, recalcitrant, recalcitrant seeds quickly lose their viability and need to be planted shortly after they're harvested, whereas orthodox seeds can be maintained for uh, a much longer period of time. Um, and the species, the condition of the seed, and the uh, age of, sometimes the age of the plant on which they were collected um, uh, help to determine longevity. And of course the conditions of storage and moisture are critical factors in uh, determining the longevity of seeds. So this week's uh, discussion question will ask you to go back and consider um, these uh, ideas that we've just talked about for testing seeds. And uh, please discuss one of those uh, situations in which a grower uh, might want to test their seeds or why it would be important uh, to rely on seed tests. And in that situation, what type of uh, seed test uh, might be used and what in important information might come out of that. Assignment uh, 6 uh, will already have done in uh, Lab 4, um, but you still will need to record your observation, keep your records, and um, publish your findings from your um, very simplified uh, uh, seed germination tests. And in Lab 6, as mentioned, we will be um, practicing grafting We'll have a guest uh, speaker coming in, uh, and we'll be going back and tending our plantings from units two and four, or from labs two and four. Uh, we'll be dissecting flowers, fruit, and seeds, and be doing a little bit of propagation work uh, back in the greenhouse on uh, uh, bulbs. So looking forward to seeing you then, and uh, please uh, continue on with your Good work and good discussions, and let me know, as always, if you have any questions or concerns uh, about this material or about the class.